Uh, thank you very much. The, wow, there's a lot of people here for 9 a.m. <laughs> it's great. I was like, oh, there'll be three people there. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this conference. I missed it last time because I was working my first job and it was too stressful. So, <laughs> so um, I'm really happy to be here this time. I could make it. So, uh, so my paper today is um, uh, more theoretical, but I, I do sort of weave in a bit of Joyce Villain because I can't seem to ever give a conference paper without talking about her, so, <laughs> so she's in there. Uh, the title of my talk today asks, are we there yet? And by there, I mean, have we as scholars and educators with a vested interest in feminism and its relationship to the visual arts and visual and material cultures produced in Canada, realized the hopes, desires, and goals for a critical feminist art history specific to the context of Canada that emerged in response to the feminist movement of the late 1960s and early 1970s. As we enter the second decade of the 21st century, has the project of Canadian feminist art history come and gone, or has it even started? Is it still relevant as a method of critical inquiry? In my talk today, I'd like to explore some of these questions and think about what is at stake in either instigating, continuing, altering, or ending the project of feminist art history in Canada. Though my talk is primarily theoretical, I'll weave in a case study on Canadian artist and filmmaker Joyce Wieland in order to concretize some of my ideas. Over the last 40 years, the larger discipline of art history has undoubtedly been transformed by feminist politics. In that rather short time span, feminist art history has shifted from a project of recovery and recuperation, one of finding so-called lost women artists and adding them into the dominant narrative of Western art, to one that questions and critiques patriarchy as one of the foundational ideologies of disciplinary art history. Within Canada, however, I would argue that while these critical discussions have generated a fair amount of work on specific women artists and the various complex relationships they've had with the art institution, much of it has not been critical and there has been little, if any, impact on the dominant narrative of Canadian art. Art historians interested in critically examining the development of feminist art practices in Canada are consequently faced with a dilemma. Is it necessary to create alternative critical frameworks in order to examine the artistic production of women artists and to critique the dominant narrative of Canadian art? If so, what would these frameworks look like? If not, how do we write, discuss, and teach feminist art production created in Canada? This is a dilemma that has preoccupied me for a long time. Initially, it was the idea that informed my doctoral research as I set out to re-examine the work of Joyce Wieland in relation to the feminist, political, social, and cultural context of Canada in the late 60s and early 70s. Having decided to focus on one of the few female artists included within the dominant narrative of Canadian art, one afforded iconic status within academic literature, the popular press, and the art institution, I was interested in exploring the terms of her inclusion and what they might tell us about the ideological basis of the dominant narrative. In other words, why was Wieland in when so many other women artists were not? I was inspired to think critically about whether alternative understandings of Wieland's art production might be possible after reading a statement by Cass Banning in her 1987 essay, The Mummification of Mommy, Joyce Wieland as the AGO's First Living Other. Framing her discussion around the 1987 retrospective of Wieland's work at the Art Gallery of Ontario, Banning was particularly critical of the exhibition catalog essays written by American art historian Lucy Lippard and American film historian Lauren Rabinowitz and the ways in which they colonized Whelan's work by drawing on American feminist theory in order to analyze it. As Banning puts it, quote, this particular brand of American feminism with its affirmative rhetoric is not problematic in and of itself, becomes something else once transposed to a Canadian context and displaced onto Whelan. The broader issue that Banning is at pains to make clear, however, is that the reason American feminist scholarship was employed at all is because, quote, there is no tradition of either critical or feminist writing to draw from in this country. By focusing her criticism on the Americanness of Lippert and Rabinowitz and the theoretical frameworks they employ, Banning identifies their scholarship as irrelevant and inadequate to the examination of Canadian feminist art. Her argument articulates a sense of frustration and even fear over perceived American academic imperialism and the need for Canadian scholars to step up to the academic plate. When I be began my doctoral thesis, my initial thought was to do what Banning suggested, create and use a critical feminist framework that was particular to the context of Canada in order to examine Whelan's art production. 
no problem, I thought. <laughs> In reality, not so easy. I have since come to see my and Banning's desire to afford, in her terms, specificity to analyses and understandings of feminist art production in Canada as a well-intentioned desire that lost its radicality before it could even begin. In other words, we never got around to taking Banning up on her suggestion, and now, 25 years later, we have to ask new questions. As I set out to come up with some new, amazing theoretical framework for my dissertation, I thought more about the frustration that Banning felt over the use of American feminist theory in analyzing Whelan's work. <coughs> the use of theoretical and conceptual frameworks developed elsewhere and applied to the study of Canada is something that Will Straw addressed a number of years ago in relation to the emergence <coughs> of cultural studies in Canadian academia. Straw points out that there has been a long-standing suspicion, those are his words, in Canada that fields of study, such as cultural studies, are, quote, ultimately validated within centers of power and legitimation located somewhere else. He argues that while intellectual cosmopolitanism may appear an inadequate, an inadequate critical outlook to adopt, it is, in fact, a very productive position to take. Some of the most advanced work in cultural studies has used the example of Canada, Straw suggests, to engage in larger debates about gl cultural globalization and postmodernism. Inferred in Straw's argument is the idea that it is possible, and arguably even necessary, to critically discuss Canadian contexts without situating those discussions within a nationalist framework. In short, Canadian does not have to imply nationalist. This is precisely what makes Canadian cultural studies Canadianized, as it is a project that insists, Straw argues, on, quote, insinuating Canadian preoccupations and theoretical insights into the larger agenda of cultural studies internationally. Using examples from Canada to explore broader shifts in critical thinking is something that disciplinary art history in Canada has not done well as it has insisted on understandings of art production rooted within a nationalist framework. If feminist art history in Canada is going to survive, one of the vital questions it needs to ask is what is at stake in the maintenance of this narrative via textbooks, exhibitions, art institutions, government funding, university curricula, etc., whose interests and agendas are served best by it and whose are not served at all. Oh, and I meant to, sh sorry, I meant to show you the exhibition catalog for that, that show two pages ago. <laughs> That's from her 87 retrospective there. Uh, well, it's certainly not breaking news that the dominant narrative of Canadian art is deeply and profoundly problematic. Uh, Anne Whitelaw, Joyce Siemens, Monica Kingagnon, and Linda Jessup, among others, have leveled critically astute arguments against the Eurocentric, patriarchal, and colonial nature of the dominant narrative in their examinations of the practices and exhibitions of major art institutions, such as the National Gallery, uh, the Canada Council and the Art Bank. From the early to mid 20th century, the publication of several survey texts by Newton McTavish, William Colgate, Graham McInnes, and Donald Buchanan, among others, established a narrative that linked the development of visual art with that of the colony to nation narrative of traditional Canadian history. A narrative that, as I will discuss, has been equally as problematic for historians. Chapters in these surveys, for example, are organized around periods constructed as key nation-building moments, such as the arrival of the French and English explorers, confederation, and the world wars. The attention they pay to the history and development of institutions such as the Royal Canadian Academy and the National Gallery of Canada emphasizes Canada's increasing cultural autonomy from Britain, and inferred in such discussions is the idea that cultural production, and specifically the visual arts, is an integral aspect of a nation's identity. In our current neoliberal and globalized moment, a moment when the nation state no longer appears to be a necessary or even valid way of engaging in a world where borders seem to matter less and less, we now have to ask why we are holding on to an increasingly outmoded, exclusionary and patriarchal structure. I'd like to further explore the idea of eradicating the nationalist discourse of the dominant narrative as a feminist intervention. Does the Canada part of Canadian feminist art history matter? Is it a relevant category of inquiry? What might happen to our understandings of Canadian art and art historical discourse if we remove the nationalist framework that created and sustained it? Historian Ian Mackay has suggested that if scholarship in Canada, and he's referring to history in particular here, is going to continue, as a viable mode of inquiry into the 21st century, then we need to entirely rethink what Canada is. 
He suggests that a productive and critical way of doing this is to see Canada as a process rather than a given place or a tangible thing. As he states, quote, Canada is best grasped as not a place, an essence, a nation, or a transcendental ideal, but as a process unfolding in time and space. With this idea, of, with this idea in mind, Canadian history is no longer, quote, all that happened that was important to the inhabitants of northern North America, but, quote, what happened as part of the hegemonic process through which a Canada came into being and became a state in northern North America. The process to which Mackay refers affected the implantation and expansion over a heterogeneous terrain of a certain politico-economic logic, to wit, liberalism. He uses the term liberal order to refer to this reconceptualization of Canada as a process of implementing and maintaining liberalism, in other words, of making liberalism hegemonic. The impact of Mackay's essay on Canadian historical discourse has been monumental. A symposium on the concept was held at the McGill Institute in 2006, and several of the papers were published uh, by U of T Press in 2009. Uh, that, that text is called Liberalism and Hegemony. In addition to numerous journal articles and book chapters that have taken Mackay up on his suggestion to reconceptualize Canadian history outside the constraints of the nation. At its most basic level, Thinking of Canada as a process of making liberalism hegemonic is about how power was and continues to be wielded. Patriarchy, argues historian Adele Perry, is consequently necessary to the liberal order's production and its power over and systematic denial of women's full humanity. With Mackay's notion of Canada in mind, I want to return to the question that I began with, whether the Canada of Canadian feminist art history is relevant. I think that what Mackay argues is a value to those of us who want to critically situate feminist art production in Canada. The first task, one that I've previously mentioned, is to expose the dominant narrative of Canadian art as one that has been profoundly shaped by the discourse of the nation state. It is important to then pay particular attention to the ways in which the dominant narrative has shaped understandings of the lives of women artists and the production and reception of their work. If the visual arts in Canada can be thought of as the process, as part of the process of installing, the lib um, installing liberalism in order to establish a homogenized and unified notion of nation state, of which capitalism and patriarchy are intimately part of, then perhaps we should be examining the ways in which women had to consistently negotiate their position in relation to liberalism, capitalism, patriarchy, and colonialism. Thinking in this way might constitute the second phase, the doing part. I'd like to think through these ideas more fully by providing an example of how a female artist, in this case Wieland, has been included within the dominant art historical narrative on certain terms, and how when we reconceptualize Canada as a process of installing a liberal order, it allows for new understandings of her art production that are rooted outside of the colony to nation narrative, and within what we might, that's a big might, call a critical feminist framework. Despite the fact that uh, the work of few women artists is included in 20th century surveys of the visual arts in Canada, the work of Wieland figures prominently. I would argue that this is due in part to the ways in which art production from Canada in the 1960s has been constructed within the literature as a moment of cultural rebirth. William Townsend, for example, writing in the 1970 text Canadian Art Today, notes that the Canadian art scene was seen as a backwater until the 1951 Massey Commission, Expo 67 and Centennial Year, and the National Gallery's 1968 exhibition of contemporary Canadian art, Art Aujourd'hui, which traveled to several uh, major cities in Europe. This was a period when the Canadian federal government was invested in promoting cultural activities and institutions as an integral part of defining national identity. Writing in 1972, William Withrow, for example, makes this connection really clear. He writes, the excitement and achievement of the 60s reached its peak in centennial year. The national consciousness, the new sense of national identity and purpose with which Canada had emerged from the Second World War had been growing quietly, steadily. Now it exploded into joyous celebration. And for the first time, the Canadian public vis visibly shared the excitement and pride in their nation's creative achievement that had hitherto seemed the private experience of only a few professionals and collectors. So it sounds pretty wild. <laughs> 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 
Um, you just don't get that passion of people writing about that moment as you do in that one. A formal and visual analysis of Whelan's work from the late 60s with its explicit nationalist imagery, the Canadian flag, the maple leaf, the national anthem, political slogans, the beaver, etc., as well as her use of the conventionally feminine and accessible medium of craft is, I would suggest, integral to her inclusion within a dominant narrative that is rooted in nationalist tropes. In his 1973 survey text, A Concise History of Canadian Painting, Dennis Reed was the first to include work by Wieland within the context of a survey, and he situates her at the center of a new artistic avant-garde that revolved around the Isaacs Gallery in Toronto. Reed notes that the countercultural artistic scene revolving around the Isaacs Gallery was exploited most successfully by the paintings Wieland exhibited there in 1962. While Reed does not discuss Wieland's works that engage in the subject matter of the Canadian nation, his inclusion of her work within the context of a revival of artistic avant-gardism within Canada constructs her work as important to the development of the visual arts in Canada and consequently to the maintenance of cultural nationalism. Perhaps one of the most evident indications that Whelan's work had come to be seen as embodying Canadian cultural nationalism is her critique of art production by Barry Lord. In his 1974 text, uh, Lord, um, The History of Painting in Canada, Lord took a Marxist approach to the dominant narrative of Canadian art. In his introduction, he positions the visual arts in Canada as an integral component in the fight against British and American cultural imperialism. His text is significant because it's one of the first to provide an extensive discussion of Whelan's work and to place such a discussion within the history and development of Canadian art. Lord's approach is critical of Canadian cultural nationalism. Among other things, he sees it as unable to address political issues stemming from American imperialism. He also argues that, quote, the artist who has taken this cultural nationalism farthest is Joyce Wieland. Lord criticizes Wieland for living in New York and selling out to an American system that he sees as imperialist and oppressive, especially in relation to Can Canada and Canadian cultural autonomy. Lord consequently argues that the work from Wieland's 1971 retrospective at the National Gallery of Canada is really, quote, a slap in the face to patriotic Canadians. It was actually US pop art using Canadian symbols as mass marketed images. His lengthy critique of Wieland's work as cosmetic nationalism suggests the extent to which understandings of her art production by the early 1970s were intimately linked with Canadian cultural nationalism. While Whelan's work has been afforded a prominent place within the dominant narrative, the terms by which she is often introduced into discussion are those of wife, of artist Michael Snow, or eccentric. Both Reed and Lord introduce Whelan into their text by acknowledging her relationship status first. Other scholars introduce Whelan by pronouncing on her physical appearance or personality. In his 1972 study, Four Decades, the Canadian group of painters and their contemporaries, Paul Duvel introduces Whelan by describing her as, quote, feminine to the fingertips, and her art production as, quote, belonging in a singular Whelan created world. As an artist, she is a loner who has created works that are once irreverent, sensuous, and happy. William Withrow introduces Wieland into his book, quote, a short, plump woman, unmindful of her appearance, Joyce Wieland was born in Toronto. <laughs> There's way worse ones, too. Uh, the characterization of Wieland as a wife, an eccentric, a loner, or wild in appearance, reinforces the idea that while she is included within the dominant narrative, she continues to operate outside of it, and especially outside the modernist notion of the artist with its defining qualities of genius, originality, and masculinity. This construction of Wieland as naive and non-threatening is subsequently transferred onto an understanding of her art production as anti-intellectual and untheoretical, an understanding that draws from both institutional literature as well as the popular press. The Wieland that emerges within dominant narrative discourse is one that signifies a politically conservative cultural nationalism that is used to strengthen the conceptualization of the visual arts during the 1960s as part of the process of nation building. Such a conceptualization denies alternative readings of her work as informed among, uh, by, among other things, her female subjectivity or feminist politics. It is also worth noting that this is a subject positioned and a politics that not coincidentally exist outside of the modern liberal construction of the individual and citizen, integral aspects of the nation state. The sexist comments that scholars make in reference to Wieland and her works of art work to subvert any perceived power that she may symbolically hold within the dominant narrative 
by reinforcing her position as ideologically incompatible with the ideal nationalist artist. If we shift understandings of Wieland and her work away from that of cultural nationalism, how might we analyze her art uh, production and what new understandings would emerge? With Mackay's concept of Canada as a process of liberal order, we might think about how Wieland's work from the late 60s and early 70s employ craft, feminine, and nationalist signifiers in order to destabilize rather than celebrate the construction of the reasoned liberal individual as a homogenous and patriarchal category and as the basis for citizenship within the liberal nation state. The late 1960s and early 1970s in Canada can be understood as a period uh, when the achievement of gender equality was promoted by the federal government as something that could be attained only within a unified liberal nation state. Federal government initiatives that assessed perceived barriers to equality for women, such as the 1971 Royal Commission on the Status of Women, gave the impression that second wave feminist concerns were not only taken seriously by the Trudeau government, but that they were also integral to the development of the modern Canadian nation. Constructing women as citizens within the Canadian nation was dependent on constructing them as liberal, rights-bearing individuals and as equal members of the modern Canadian nation state. The effort to reconceptualize women as citizens might help to explain why the concept of the Canadian nation became an important subject matter in Whelan's work from the late 60s and early 70s, and what led her to famously proclaim, quote, I think of Canada as female. I think it is important to pay attention not only to the historical context in which Wieland was working, but with Mackay's ideas in mind, how the deployment of liberalism, capitalism, and patriarchy in a particular moment were negotiated by her. I think this reconceptualization of Canada can help us move beyond the limited and rigid boundaries of the colony to nation narrative, as well as romanticized and essentialist notions of Canadian identity. If Canada is going to remain part of Canadian feminist art history, it must do so only insofar as it signals to us that we must consider the ways in which women's art production has had to contend with the larger realities of the liberal order, liberalism, patriarchy, capitalism, and colonialism. Those histories affected women artists in different and unequal ways, and it's important to pay attention to the specifics of why and how that happened. In conclusion, uh, in her pivotal 1998 essay, A Tale of Three Women, The Visual Arts in Canada, Joy Siemens was building on Monica Kingano's 1987 essay, A Work in Progress, Canadian Women in the Visual Arts. These still remain two of the most sustained examinations of the development of feminist art practices in Canada. Siemens concludes her essay by making her own subjectivity transparent, noting that she realizes her essay is recuperative in nature and that this was a first generation goal. She goes on to state that, quote, Theorizing patriarchy, identity, and gender are essential to changing the nature of the art world and to the creation of a new historiography. Siemens admits that her essay does not do this, that it does not, quote, address the root causes of inequality. Within the Canadian arts community, she goes on to argue, we still require a consolidation of feminist scholarship and innovative strategies to rework traditional approaches to the theory and the history of art. This message is intended for a new generation of scholars, scholars such as myself. While I certainly don't have all the answers, I hope that some of what I've discussed today might contribute to such strategies. Although I don't think we're there yet, we're most definitely on the way. Thank you. <laughs>